Welcome back, honors. Hi, it's Mrs. Terry. My name is Maria. Thank you for supporting all of us this week. All of us. <laughs> and all of our bellies. <laughs> we really appreciate you and all your love, especially this one. And here I am. And there's Hello, Jersey. Big girl. <laughs> You're the best. Thanks for your uh, your compassion. <laughs> Times are tough. It's nice to meet you. This yeah, is it's very nice to meet you. <laughs> I don't believe we've met yet. Um, these puppies are up for adoption. This is now an advert. Okay. <laughs> I think I should give a full description. This baby. No, we won't. But if you want a baby in your house that has a very round, perfect belly. I thought we were keeping that baby. Uh, well, we don't know yet. <laughs> they have perfect bellies and perfect paws. Um, everything about them is perfect. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Listen to your teacher. What else do they have to do? Anything else? Um, Set no. for They're going to get to see our pictures from Rome in this flip, though, of me uh, uncomfortably trying to smile. And me uncomfortably going through all of that ancient stuff that you're probably learning about. Hey, get out of here. No, uncomfortably It was nothing. fun. It was just time. a lot of walking. It was very hot. It was November. You had a jacket on. I think I remember being very toasty. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Josie. <laughs> Were you just smiling? Okay, the intro is She's long perfect. Enough. I need to get started. No. Things like 30 minutes. Josie, oh. tell them how funny I am. <laughs> Go ahead, tell them. Tell them. She doesn't want to tell you. Anyway, enjoy Rome. It's going to be great. <clears throat> uh, okay, so I'll be on my way. Oh, wait, she's smiling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's okay. Go. Bye. All right, yeah, so welcome back again, honors. Let's restart this whole flip again real quick. But yeah, thank you for that. My wife did want to tell y'all thank you for being so supportive during this week and everything like that. But let's go ahead and start off right where we left off in class. We were talking about ancient Rome and discussing a lot of different things about their growth, their culture. And the big thing that we stopped talking about was we were talking about the Gallic invasion, right? So the Gallic invasion happened in 390 BC. It was a crazy story where kind of Rome needed a reality check, right? Rome needed to be checked and they needed to have their authority checked so they could grow and expand into what they would later on in history become, right? Because after the Gallic invasion, they would organize their military, they would expand their city defenses, they would build a better wall around the city of Rome, and they would actually be able to achieve the growth period that they're going to have later on when we get into this thing called the Punic Wars, and we'll actually get into that in the next class, right? So Rome is going to organize its army into that legion system we talked about, and it's going to allow, and they're like in the process, they're going to focus mostly on expanding throughout Italy, right? So they don't actually start taking people over outside side of Italy until about 292 BC, okay? So just to give you a heads up, they're still kind of at the period where they're practicing like slight defensive warfare and they're only taking over people in Italy. But those people they did take over in Italy, they allowed them to keep their customs, their religion, pledge to pay taxes, they extended citizenship to many of them, which was a pretty big theme of Roman society. And these are the people that they were fighting against, including some Gallic warriors and barbarian tribes, and this would be the soldier that they're going to start coming up against, and we left off talking about a lot of their weapons, right? We talked about the caligos, the boots with the hobnails in the bottom, we talked about catapults, we talked about uh, gladius, the short sword, pylums, crossbows, all those things like that. There's also a couple other like very, very cool weapons the Romans came up with, this one being actually what's known as a Roman ballista. So basically a ballista is a giant bow and arrow and it launches not like just bows or arrows that are about like that long, it launches bolts that are actually closer to six feet long, right? So it launches spears out of it. There are also these bad boys that they would throw down on the ground before they would actually have a major, major battle with barbarian tribes. They're barbs, so whenever somebody would run over top of them, it would pierce the bottom of a barbarian foot, right? And so they're going to create a military that's just very, very scary. And by about 200 BC, the Romans extended their power to pretty much the entire Italian peninsula. And they're going to start establishing little, like, colonial cities and colonial areas all the way through the Italian peninsula. And they're going to take over all these different people, right? They took over the Umbrians, the Etruscans, the Sam Knights, the Apu, blah, 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 the uh, Carthians, they end up taking the Greeks over later. Later on, they're also going to extend their rule over the Celts, but that does take quite some time because the Celts were a pretty big thorn in their side for many, many years. But in this process, they will extend their rulership throughout the entirety of the Italian peninsula by about 200 BC. They never would have been able to do that had the Gauls not actually invaded in 390, leading them to actually create a better and more developed Roman military, right? So the Romans, though, also, as they actually extend their control throughout the the peninsula also focus on building up their infrastructure right so infrastructure is like roads and sewage systems and like any kind of like system that a government will have created so that they can actually like practice daily things or actually move different items or water fresh water systems that's a part of your infrastructure right so the romans are going to build roads 
everywhere they actually take over to connect their whole empire and share the fruits of their conquering with their new citizens, right? And just to give you a heads up, there's a very, very famous line about the Romans and you need to jot this down. It's very, very important. And it goes like this. All roads lead to Rome, right? All roads lead to Rome. Write that down. All roads lead to Rome. It's kind of this moniker that the Romans adopted to basically give in the, out the sense that the roads that the Romans would be, would be building are creating a spider web of infrastructure that can lead anyone that needs to get back to Rome easily back to Rome. This being one of the most famous roads that was ever created, you need to jot this down, it's very important. It's going to be created in about 290-ish BC, or about 216 BC, or actually no, it's about like 318 BC. So now, it, this is the Apnean Way. The Apnean Way, okay? So as in the Apennine Mountains, the Apnean Way. So the Apnean Way was a very, very sophisticated road that was even fully paved that cut all the way through the Apennine Mountains and actually extended their rulership everywhere. And as you can see on the Apnean Way or a Roman road, they even used like cement, crushed stone, stone slabs and paved everything and it even gave it drainage ditches. So it was a very, very sophisticated system of building of these roads throughout the entirety of Italy. Now, also something you need to understand is that not every road looked like that, right? So, like, not every road was as sophisticated as the Atnian Way. A bunch of the roads were actually just kind of, like, cart paths and, like, you know, just pressed down grass and stuff like that, or just, like, simple roads or paths, okay? But still, a road's a road, no matter how, like, you actually decide to cut it. But all roads lead to Rome, right? Now, Roman history in generality is something that we started talking about a little bit in class, when we were discussing the difference between the kingdom and the republic, it's divided into just three different time periods, right? You got the kingdom period, the republic period, and the empire period. Now in this class in particular, we do not talk much about the kingdom period at all, right? So we don't talk much about the kingdom period at all, just due to the fact that what you're basically focusing on is the growth and expansion of Rome under these different kings, and then also the Etruscan kings come in, and then the Romans kick the kings out. The very first king being Romulus, the last king of like Rome being Tarquinus Superbus, right? So that's the kingdom period. And the kingdom period saw like a couple of important things happen. Apparently the Circus Maximus started being built during this time period, which we'll talk about that in class when... We'll actually start talking about that in class in the next class, right? The Circus Maximus being this big arena that they actually used in the earliest period before the Colosseum was ever built. So things like that happened in the Kingdom period. And the Kingdom period also sees the growth of some basic Roman cultural things. Now, the Republic period is going to be the thing we focus on the most, right? The Republic period is when we're going to start talking about, after they kicked the Etruscan kings out, the establishment of their government that's going to be a very, very astute system, having a Senate, elected officials, and kind of blending the ideas of a Greek democratic system into their new Republic system System, which would actually have a very interesting direct rulership by the people. We'll talk a lot about that and set that whole thing up today in this flip, right? And then later on, we'll talk about the Empire period, which starts with Augustus and actually moves through the end of Rome all the way up until 476 AD. It's their longest time period, give or take, and it's also probably their most important one, right? And as you can see, the kingdom period is pretty, pretty short, so we don't actually really spend much time talking about it. But when we're analyzing Roman history, when we were talking about all their cultural stuff or the things that we've been talking about for the last few classes, you have to understand that we were talking about it kind of out of order, but just kind of telling these different stories that occurred mostly during the Republic period to give you a semblance of what the heck is going on in Rome and where some of these like different systems and traditions are going to start, right? So we didn't even talk about these things in order. So Romulus is going to stab Remus in 753 BC. The first Roman roads are built in 319, which is the next unit, but we just ended up talking about it just now, right? Cincinnatus dictatorship is going to be in 458 BC, and then the Gallic sacking of Rome was in 390 BC. That is a typo. It's not 309 BC. It's 390 BC. So those moments, though, most of them are happening during the Republic period. And when you're talking about the Roman Republic period, you have to understand the government and everything other major cultural thing that's happening during the Roman Republic, right? So the biggest thing you need to know about the Roman Republic is the letters that symbolize the city of Rome, right? Those four letters right there, S, P, Q, R, are so important that I even have them on my socks right now, right? C, 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 C. So like the thing about it though, and that was actually completely unintentional. I had just gone and played golf, or I had just gone out this morning and just happened to actually have them on my feet, right? So like now, SPQR is going to be the biggest thing about Rome for several hundred years, okay? Those four letters kind of boil down and begin to symbolize Rome during their Republic period, okay? It's such a big deal, the letters SPQR, that literally modern day Romans still know it and use it, right? This is a, this is a manhole cover in Rome that I took a picture of. So this is in modern Rome, that's a cigarette butt, this is in modern Rome and I took this picture in about 2016, right? When I was there. So 
SPQR is such a massive and important deal that they literally, in modern Rome, slap it on top of sewers, right? So, like, just because they know that, like, to the Roman people, it's such a big deal. They have it on buildings. They have it on shirts. Some people get it tattooed onto themselves in the modern era, right? SPQR, very, very big deal. But some of you are like, okay, SPQR, SPQR, you keep saying these four letters, and apparently it's really important. But what does that mean? It literally means their republic, right? So it talks about the Roman Republic period following the getting out of the Etruscan kings when they ran out Tarquinus Superbus. They adopted these four letters to symbolize the fact that the Romans would jot this down, but Romans would never have kings again, right? So, and they use these four letters to demonstrate that they would never have kings again because they adopted a republic government system. Their republic government system was known as Senatus Populus Romanum, right? So that's supposed to have an O right there. But Senatus Populus Romanum in Latin means the Roman Senate and people, okay? So the thing about it, though, is that the SPQR Roman Republic system is all completely focused around this central place, right? That place, my friends, is known as the Roman Forum, right? Forum spelled F-O-R-U-M, right? The Roman Forum, which began to be built right around 500 BC, right 10 years after they actually like pushed the Etruscans out and began to establish their Roman Republic period, they began to build and construct this thing known as the Forum. So for a long time before they actually built it in 500 BC, this was not what it is now, okay? So when I say Roman Forum, it's basically their version of the Greek Agora, right? It's a central meeting location, marketplace, and a hub of daily life in Rome. Now, the thing about it is, it's even more important to the city of Rome than any agora was to any Greek city-state. The Roman Forum is massively important. The Roman Forum started out, though, originally not as being a marketplace city place and a place where the actual government was ruled from. What it started out as was a cemetery, right? So jot that down. Started out as a cemetery. And it was a very kind of boggy little structure. They would let cows and goats herd down here because there was always standing water inside of it. So the thing about the Roman Forum, though, is that the Romans then, about 500 BC, are going to build bigger walls on the edge of the Tiber to control some of the floodwaters, leaving this space dry and flat. And it's on a valley between Capitoline and Palatine Hills, right? So that way it's a low point between these two major hills, and it becomes a central focal point between the seven hills of Rome, making it the perfect place for a marketplace, right? Just like the Greeks had the Acropolis that was higher up on the hill that had the temples to the gods and goddesses, We've got the seven hills being higher up in Rome, and then they've got their forum down in the valley, right? And the forum that may have started out as a cemetery grew to expand to be the focal central meeting place for their senate, right? So, like, everything about the forum is massively important. And I took this picture, and I've also been there, right? So, like, we're going to talk a couple of facts about the Forum real quick. What you need to do now is if I tell you to jot down a bullet point about the Roman Forum, it's very important that you do that. So starting off with this one central th fact about the Roman Forum is that, yes, it is a marketplace. Yes, it is a central meeting location. Yes, it like, is all of those very important things. But jot this down as well. It also housed many different god and goddess temples. So there was a lot of religious activity that went on down in the Roman Forum as well. Remember when we talked about Roman Romulus and Remus. And then apparently Vesta, or like the goddess Vesta, the Vestal Virgins, right? They actually had a temple or like an actual fire. The eternal Vestal fire was down in the Roman form. It actually would have been back over here in that direction over there. These uh, columns right there, we believe are actually also the columns of maybe the temple of, not the temple of Jupiter because it would have been much larger would have been on Capitoline Hill, but it's one of the main temple gods that actually would have existed there. Possibly Castor and Pollux, right? Castor and Pollux being these two like Roman gods of war. And apparently right underneath there was a barbershop where you could also get your teeth pulled out right so like because apparently in rome you can get your hair cut and get your teeth pulled out in the exact same place so but that's just kind of an semblance of like this marketplace religious place idea that you can actually see here and as you can see it's not in the best shape as it used to be in it actually is unfortunately kind of broken down in a lot of ways but you can also see the phases of roman architecture and roman buildup in this picture alone. So when Rome was first being established, much of it was built out of simple brick, right? As you can see right here behind me. And then later on, under the reign of Augustus, when we get close to the Empire period, many marble temples and to the gods and goddesses would be added. And you can actually see pieces of that right there over my shoulder, right? So also going forward, there again is my lovely wife who helped me introduce this flip and wanted to give you all a big sh th thank you shout out. And this is me uncomfortably trying to smile because I don't know what to do with my face when I'm supposed to smile for a picture. As you can see, it looks like I'm either 
about to tell you a bad thing or I poop my pants and I don't really know what's going on. So we're going to move on from that one because it's really, really stupid looking. Now looking at this though, this is super important as well. That right there is a victory arch, right? So the thing you need to understand is that every time Rome would take somewhere over, they would usually build what's known as a victory arch, right? And as you can see on the very, oh wait, whoa, that's sideways. As you can see on the very, very, okay, stop going sideways. As you can see on the very, very top of it, it actually has the word, there it is, Sinitus up there at the very top, and then underneath it says Tito or Titus, or it actually says Titus up there at the top, right? And the thing about Titus was he is the guy that is actually going to have this thing built. And the archway of Titus is going to be built, apparently, when they took over what is now modern-day Jerusalem. There are actually carvings on the inside of this arch that show them bringing back a lot of different Jewish relics and items when they took over Jerusalem. And now, the, and the big thing that actually ends up happening, though, Jerusalem also being the area where Christ was born and actually like had his preachings and teachings. And so you can actually see how the Romans had a very, very heavy hand inside of that area of Rome as well. Also, if you ever had a Roman parade or a triumph, which is what I was talking about in class, Julius Caesar had three of them, it would actually end by going through this archway and then down into the forum below. And so another big thing you got to understand about the Roman forum is that a lot of people lived around the outside of it. So this right here is actually me standing at the base of, look at how much better these pictures are. Look, because due to the fact that my back is turned and the back of my head is the best view of myself during a picture. So there are apartment style dwellings that flanked all the way around the outside of the forum. Jot that down. Most people that lived in Rome lived in what you would consider like a modern day apartment. Very, very small, and I'm standing at the base of one of these apartments, and you can actually see where the floors used to be constructed with these little holes right there, but they actually ran brass rods inside of it to create a stable platform to create a floor, right? So the thing about it, though, going forward, is the Roman form is very, very important. And it's also really important, though, that you know the people that walked in and out of the forum every single day. So the Republican government is going to be very important, and we're basically just going to go over a couple of vocab terms that you would need to understand when you're referring to the Republic in totality. First of all, what a republic is, a republic is a government that is ruled, a, that it, a government ruled, a chosen by the people. Wow, this is a terrible definition. It's a government that is ruled over, that rules over the people that is chosen directly by the people, right? So the republican style government is supposed to actually have a direct representation of people throughout the empire in their government, right? So it's ruled by the people. That's what a republic is, okay? So the consul position is going to be very, very important that we're going forward when we talk about the Roman Republic. The consuls are either two of the highest elected chief officials of Rome. So they're basically like the president, but there's two of them, right? And they only serve, jot this down, for a year, right? They serve for a year. So that is it. They get elected every single year. And yes, you can serve more than once, but you can't work in consecutive years, right? So if I got elected consul one year, I'd have to take a year off and then I can get elected consul again. And nine times out of 10, these consuls are actually senators when they're elected or they're going to be senators soon enough. So the dictator is another very important one that we talked a little bit about already when we talked about Cincinnatus. That is a ruler who was brought in during a war and then they eventually step down. And then last but not least, you got the Senate. And the Senate is the Supreme Council of the Roman Republic, and it is the highest governing bo body. And the size of the Senate fluctuates to, like, periodically. The Senate, as the Supreme Council, advises the consuls, helps write law, and they're considered to be the most powerful group in the entire Roman Republic. That is very important that you jot that down. Most powerful group in the entire Roman Republic. The other thing about the senators, though, is that as their size fluctuates, when they started out during the earliest forms of the Republic, they had about like a couple hundred senators. By the time that Augustus rules, there's going to be 900 senators. And the other thing about the senators that you need to jot down as well is that they had to rule for life. So they literally ruled for their life from the moment they were elected. They were a senator until the day they died. And they also had to be from one very important social class. They had to come from the patricians. But before we talk about who those people are, let's go ahead and talk about a couple of other last things. Speaking of the Roman Forum, another very important thing about it is Roman law is going to be very important because it's going to affect the lives of daily people, okay? And the Roman law code that the, everybody, including the senators and everybody else, had to live their lives by was known as the Twelve Tables. Now, the funny thing about the Twelve Tables, and we'll talk some little goofy laws about it whenever we get into class, is that it wasn't a very efficient system. It was, like, very, very rarely referenced due to the fact that, like, 
Romans didn't operate as much on like a written constitution. They didn't have one, right? So the Romans had no written constitution whatsoever. All this stuff that we're going to talk about with the Roman government was not set up on a piece of paper anywhere. And so they actually it was just a system of adopted beliefs and traditions. But one of those most important beliefs and traditions is who was allowed to rule throughout Rome, right? So Roman or Roman society believed that there were only two classes of individuals, right? That there were two social classes within Rome. One of them being these people called the patricians and the other one being called the plebeians, right? So the patricians were the wealthy land-owning and ruling class, actually symbolized in this picture right here. So as you can see right there, that is a patrician meal. They are laying down on their stomachs. That is how wealthy patricians actually apparently feasted together. They have servants that are filling their glasses. They are very, very wealthy. They lead the military during times of war. They are typically officers in the military. They are also, they work in the Senate. Every senator had to be a patrician, and they were the only ones, apparently, who knew Roman law. And patricians only took up about maybe 5% of the Roman population, probably a little bit less. Another thing you should jot down as well is they pay almost nothing in taxes. So the thing going forward, though, is if you understand what a patrician is, which is very important that you highlight their name, it's also important that you understand what a plebeian is. The plebeians were the common people of Rome, right? Those are the people that didn't have maybe like a large amount of land. They only had maybe a farm that they actually ruled over and owned because they were just all the regular people. So over 95% of Rome were what was known as plebeians or sometimes referred to as plebes. You can actually use their name to insult people in the modern era. You can actually call somebody a plebe, and if you're calling them a plebe, it basically means that they probably don't know how to read and write, and that they're just very basic, right? So plebeians had four jobs that they could actually take in. They could be farmers, soldiers, craft workers, or merchants, right? So that, though, very important that you notice, underline those jobs, because they're going to come into major play later. Because some of you are probably thinking to yourself right now, for example, one of you, like, I don't know who's actually thinking of this right now. I don't know. We're going to say, uh, man, who is thinking this right now? We're going to say, like, Mackenzie, right? Mackenzie Blank is thinking to herself, like, oh, wait, well, that's pretty much everything they do in Rome, right? Farmers, soldiers, craft workers, merchants. That's, like, every job that you could possibly have, because it's ancient Rome. It's not like you were, like, you know, a dancer or a disco queen or something like that during Rome. So the thing about it, though, also that we have to understand is that... I know, Love you. Now, anyway, so they also have a voice in the government. They're allowed to vote, but they can't be elected to anything, which is very messed up and super not fair. And they also pay the bulk of the taxes. Slaves also exist in society, but they were considered to be at the very, very bottom of, like, of society in Rome, if considered a like, class or citizen whatsoever. Now, these people right here are considered more plebeian status. Look at their clothing. They are not wearing togas. They are wearing simple tunics. And that is why you have to understand the difference between these two classes is because they're going to get into a little bit of an argument with each other later on, okay? So I'm going to cover that little thing up. You don't need that right there. But this is the last thing that I'll leave you with, okay? So when Rome adopted their Republican system in 509 B.C., <laughs> After they run the Etruscans out, they created this Republican system that would have several distinct bodies, including consuls, senators, the citizen assemblies, and the dictator, right? Now, what I need you to do is go ahead and jot this down. So go ahead and hit pause on this. I'm going to end right here. We're going to start off class by explaining what the Roman Republic looked like in its earliest phases at the very beginning. I know this is an intense flip. There was a lot of stuff going on. But we're about to get to the point soon where we actually just kind of start moving and progressing one thing after another, all right? Talk to you guys soon. Y'all have a great weekend.